Good evening all to the 87th session of the weekly huddle. I'm Anup and joining me today is my uh, colleague and co-host Praneet. We both are cardiologists working at Care Hospital, Banjara Hills. We have been doing this, uh, the weekly huddle program for quite some time now. This is our 87th week that we are uh, continuing this. Uh, most of the attendees today, they are uh, regular uh, attendees of the weekly huddle. So I'll skip the format part. Essentially, what we tend to do is we pick up a clinical topic or a clinical case, and then we try to discuss about that particular case, like what we would do in our routine clinical practice. The idea here is to uh, try to establish what is, uh, what is the scientific knowledge uh, and try to put it in our own practical perspective. This is not a speaker and audience model, which means that at any point, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and share your thoughts or put in a question. As a courtesy, you let the other person finish uh, their thought before you uh, start speaking yourself. Today's topic is uh, very basic, I must say. And this is something which, uh, while it is not directly related to cardiology per se, this could be a symptom manifestation across the spectrum. And uh, initially I was trying to see that who is the kind of doctor who would treat oral ulcers. And uh, I realized that pretty much every single doctor needs to know a little bit about oral ulcers, A, because it is very common. So no matter what kind of specialization you are practicing or general physician, you are bound to see patients who would complain to you about oral ulcers. So uh, you need to have a basic idea about uh, the disease part. And uh, secondly, uh, some of the myths surrounding it, some of the established knowledge surrounding it that also we should know. And equally important for us is to understand uh, what are the issues surrounding, uh, surrounding um, oral ulcers that we should, uh, that we should uh, pay attention to. So uh, I'll read out the case to you. And uh, as a standard format of the weekly huddle, I will ask uh, my colleague Praneet to give his initial impression. I will uh, ask uh, some of my other attendees about their impression, how they would go. And joining me today is uh, my dermatology colleague, uh, Dr. Sapna Priya. And uh, we are also expecting uh, uh, a gastroenterology colleague of ours who can also share their thought uh, about uh, today's topic. So the case today is a 62 year old male. He actually is uh, a distant relative of mine. And he just happened to curbside me over the phone. And he asked me, hey, listen, this is what is going on. What do you suggest? So essentially it's like taking a second opinion from me, but rather than coming for a clinic visit, he's, he's asking me over the phone. So 62 year old male, he is currently on treatment for diabetes, hypertension and uh, benign prostate hyperplasia, all of which are reasonably controlled. He had been having this history of recurrent oral ulcers which are painful, for which somebody recommended him to undergo colonoscopy. And essentially he called me to ask whether colonoscopy is needed or not. Uh, I tried to inquire a little bit more about his oral ulcers. So he told me, uh, he, uh, he typically gets one to two uh, ulcers, mostly over his buccal mucosa. It happens once a month or so, and they are not at one particular place. They tend to happen at different places. And uh, each of those ulcers, they last for about three to four days. When I asked him about other associated symptoms, he really didn't uh, mention anything except that uh, he has this excessive gas, this abdominal bloating and gas kind of symptom, which is also chronic. And for that, he sometimes take Ayurvedic preparation or whatnot. And sometimes he takes these uh, ESAP goal and sometimes laxative. And that kind of takes care of his problem. He otherwise uh, is pretty healthy. He doesn't have any other uh, active uh, untreated medical issues. He walks around uh, almost 10 kilometers a day without any major issue. He does not have any established uh, cardiac issue. His active medications include metformin, linagliptin, low sartan, atorvastatin, tamsulosin, and a multivitamin. Most of these medicines for him have been standard uh, medication that he has been taking for quite some time. So the discussion that we are gonna have today is, 
Is there a need for basic investigation whenever we talk about these recurrent oral ulcers? Do we need to investigate a little bit or uh, should we assume that these are idiopathic ulcers and that we don't need to do anything? And uh, going for the treatment part of it, what kind of empiric therapy are we doing? And I have divided the empiric therapy into two groups. One is uh, pain control and the second is healing. So is there something that we are doing to uh, hasten the healing process? And uh, uh, what kind of pain control strategy we tell to our patients? And then very important is how to identify red flags uh, where these oral ulcers could be a sign of systemic illness. Like in this particular case, uh, the index patient has been advised uh, for a colonoscopy. I'm sure you understand the thought process behind it. And uh, in the same line, when and whom to refer to for a specialized care. So when should we start referring these cases and to whom should we referring these cases? So uh, Praneet, I hope you got the case uh, details. How would you approach this patient? And I'll ask the rest of my attendees once you share your thoughts. All yours, Praneet. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So this case is uh, symptoms. Uh that he has one you mentioned about um, ulcers also some uh, dyspeptic symptoms in the form of excessive gas etc probably that i believe is uh, metformin related uh, but i think that is not uh, significantly contributing to him the main uh, thing that uh, is the topic of discussion is the ulcers which is there once in a while for a diabetic patient firstly i would uh, try to see how well controlled his diabetes is because an uncontrolled diabetes uh, is a predisposition for uh, skin and subcutaneous infections and probably oral ulcers as well. Uh, also, the, the possibility of having fungal infections in the form of oral candidiasis. Second thing, uh, most important thing I believe is bad oral hygiene. Uh, if there is a bad oral hygiene that can contribute. So, I would try to focus on uh, his uh, hygiene and... Uh, I would suggest him to uh, probably brush his uh, teeth uh, twice daily, uh, gargle his mouth, preferably with mouthwash if possible, to maintain the uh, oral hygiene as well. Second thing, um, uh, probably because of uh, any uh, tooth-related issues, like if the patient has any dentures or if those uh, tooth are decaying or if they are having any uh, pointy things or a projecting spike things which might probably injure his uh, oral cavity and can predispose to uh, his oral ulcers is what I would see. Maybe uh, for a second opinion, I would uh, refer him to a dentist to check for his uh, uh, teeth alignment and is there anything probably which contributes to his ulcers. Uh, regarding um, and probably one thing I would like to ask is about his history of smoking. Uh, both in terms of uh, smoking cigarettes or BDs and uh, uh, chewing tobacco or uh, these uh, gutkas or the kind of things which can also contribute to his oral ulcers. If that is the case, then I will uh, suggest him to uh, quit the same thing. Now, the uh, treatment, part, um, treatment part, most importantly, again, is focusing on uh, strict tight control of uh, diabetes. Uh, maintaining oral hygiene, avoiding uh, tobacco and smoking if there is there. Uh, regarding the treatment of um, oral ulcers, if it suggests of candidiasis, I will give an empirical therapy of uh, fluconazole for two weeks. Uh, local uh, ulcer, what I can, um, what I recommend or is a practice is the commonly used Zyte gel to, for a local application which uh, helps in um, healing. To a certain extent, and if the pain is too much, then uh, the the dento gel is something which is there, which I think uh, also has um, uh, lignocaine uh, with it, which helps in probably getting uh, uh, helps in relieving the pain. So these are the two things that I can suggest him to take in addition to what I mentioned. Now we know that oral ulcers can be a part of uh, systemic illness. Now, the, what are the red flags for systemic illness specifically? I don't know, but if there are any other uh, signs and symptoms of systemic illness in the form of any fever, weight loss, joint pain, etc., probably this can be red flags, but specifically, I don't think I have any 
idea and regarding referring to somebody if they are persistent uh, despite doing these preliminary measures which i suggested then i may uh, send him to a gastroenterologist but and and as a dentist uh, as i already mentioned so these are the thoughts that i can get regarding this case and if there's anything i can add up um, anup okay so pranit there are a lot of things i will start with you only and then i will go forward with uh, others sure. and uh, we do have dermatologist with us i don't think our gastro colleague has joined yet please correct me pranit if you can see him in the list no he uh, yeah, hasn't joined yet huh? so you mentioned few things diabetes control and oral ulcer now while uh, we always attribute uh, things which to us seems quite obvious uh maybe you or somebody can share their thoughts uh, about uh, is diabetes control really correlated with oral ulcers or is it something which is just a urban legend which we have we have heard from our colleagues and our colleagues have heard from their own colleagues and now a person with diabetes everything that goes wrong we attribute it to poor diabetes control so i don't know if diabetes control is related to oral ulcers and uh, oral hygiene again the dental evaluation that you mentioned i think that is very pertinent particularly if ulcers keep happening at the same spot again and again then to, then there could be those sharp teeth which could be causing those but a poor oral hygiene uh i believe they can cause infection uh but uh, again they themselves causing oral ulcers that also is something i wish we had a dentist uh, on the panel today which we could discuss dental evaluation you mentioned already smoking you mentioned in fact uh, uh, i have been reading back in the day that there are very few diseases that smokers don't have and uh, oral ulcers is one of one of them for whatever reason smoking seems to be a preventive thing for these ulcers and what not i believe i believe even ibd is less common in uh, smokers like crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and what not uh chewing tobacco and supari is certainly that is very 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 uh, pertinent particularly in the hindi belt of uh, india where uh, chewing this pan masala and uh, tobacco and uh, this uh, supari which is a raw uh, form of it they certainly can be the cause of um, uh, recurrent oral ulcers this index case that we are talking about he is a non smoker and he does not do uh, any of this chewing pan masala and what not you the one question that i have particularly is you mentioned about oral candida and if there is a suggestion you would give him um, a shot of fluconazole so my question to you is what makes you suspicious of oral ulcers being candida and tell us how do you dose the fluconazole that you do in your opd for these for these cases usually uh, you uh, see the um uh, white uh, um, patches uh, uh, sometimes which mimic something like uh, curdy deposits uh, on the teeth so you ask the patient to uh, rinse their mouth properly and do exam in their oral cavity again uh, most of them uh, they disappear if it is food particle related but it continues to be there and if there any there is any associated uh, signs of inflammation like redness or anything then uh, that is a uh marker for me to say that it is an candidiasis for me i have a low threshold to start uh, uh, therapy i believe diabetes uh, is a significant predisposition for oral candidiasis despite uh, controlled diabetes so i have a low threshold to give them a trial of uh, fluconazole and uh, when i give them i give 150 mg of an oral tablet for 2 weeks for uh, Uh, management of empiric therapy of uh, candidiasis thank you pranit so what you are referring to is commonly called as oral thrush which uh, as you pointed out uh, can be very easily seen uh, in the oral cavity which comes as a white uh, whitish patch and sometimes uh, it may not be very obviously visible because it may be there in the early esophagus or uh, oropharyngeal area and diabetes certainly is a predisposing factor for oral thrush uh oral thrush can be managed with topical drugs as well as oral drugs you did mention about oral fluconazole 
And when Dr. Sopna is, is on, I will ask her about her recommendation, how she would deal with this uh, oral thrush business. So let me, uh, let me move forward. If there is anybody in the attendee who wants to take up today's case and uh, share their thought, please go ahead. And uh, as I'm going down the list, I'm just going to pick up a few of the names. Uh, we have Dr. Praveen with us. Praveen, I hope you are able to hear us. If you are, could you please unmute yourself and share your thoughts about today's case or topic that we are discussing? Good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, regarding this case, uh, the patient having uh, recurrent ulcers every month, uh, I would uh, like to consider uh, uh, the uh, location of uh, the ulcers occurring. Uh, and uh, uh, if it is of the same site, uh, then we will be seeing for the local causes. Uh, the most common cause would be if it is occurring regularly and uh, at the same site, uh, every very often, it would be mostly because of the molars, uh, uh, unerupted molars or the tissue or the molars. So the wisdom tooth, whatever we call it as, uh, that could be the cause. And uh, then I would be referring to the dentist. If the ulcers are uh, very tiny and occurring once in a while uh, all over the mucosal surface and uh, uh, then I would uh, see whether there are any stress-related factors that are causing the stress ulcers can cause. And uh, if there are any drug-related issues, I would be seeing. But uh, in this patient, there is no usage of nicorandil or anything or a beta blocker. <clears throat> of course, uh, the vasodilatory beta blocker only would be causing the mucosal ulcers. Uh, patient is not on uh, any alpha blockers also. Sir, patient is on alpha blocker, sir. Yes, he's taking tamsulosin. Then uh, that would be uh, probably I would look uh, regarding that could be the cause of the oral ulcer. And uh, regarding further uh, the red flags, uh, if uh, they are of multiple and occurring at various locations, I would uh, considering his age and uh, I would consider uh, sending him for colonoscopy. Sir. I have only this knowledge uh, regarding the ulcer. So Praveen, before I let you go, what, what are you looking at in colonoscopy? Because this guy has already been recommended to get colonoscopy by somebody. So uh, what, are, what is your thought process? What are you looking at? Uh, what you call uh, multiple polyps, uh, sir? I, I have no idea, but uh, the, uh, the, I think of uh, polyps or any masks, sir. Because the age of onset and uh, recurrent coming in recurrent, I would think of uh, colon polyps or uh, the masks, uh, the what you call tumor or malignancy. And can you please share your thoughts regarding that beta blocker you were saying again that I I never I never thought in that direction. Uh, certain beta blockers predispose for oral ulcers. Uh, yes, sir. Non-selective beta blockers, and uh, uh, there are some case reports of carbidolol causing uh, the uh, ulcer, sir. So you would think that all these carbidolol, bisoprolol, nebivilol, all of these can potentially cause uh, oral ulcer, sir? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Uh, non-selective as well as what you call the uh, non-selective beta blockers. Okay. And the uh, uh, some case reports of uh, carbidolol causing the oral ulcer, sir. Okay. And Nicorandil, you mentioned, I think this, this is something we briefly discussed on our WhatsApp group. Yes, sir. Uh, Nicorandil, Nicorandil, of course, sir, uh, they say that Nicorandil causes oral ulcer, but uh, they say that uh, if we go beyond uh, uh, 10 mg BD, that would be causing the, but uh, we have seen uh, at lower doses also. Okay. And then Tamsulosin, again, this is something that if it's a class effect, then it will be a problem because uh, these patients, they need to be on alpha blockers for their BPH. So it certainly could be an issue if alpha blocker is causing uh, uh, the ulcers because now uh, whether you use tamsulosin or prazosin or psilodosin or whatever, if this class of drug is causing oral ulcer, then it's a problem. Again, this is something I don't, it doesn't come in my mind reflexly that these drugs could be implicated for recurrent ulcers. 
uh, I will move on and uh, there is one question in the chat box I'm reading. Dr. Archana, I'm reading your question. How about uh, Rebagen? Rebagen, I have not heard of this before. Uh, Dr. Archana, if you don't mind uh, unmuting yourself and either elaborate your question or, or tell us about this Rebagen because I have not heard of this before. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Anu. Uh, what uh, I have known, uh, like many seniors in my practice, I'm basically a family physician. So for chronic uh, recurrent uh, ulcers, we give ribagen up to 100 milligram three times a day for about 10 days. It is also an ulceroprotective agent. Okay. Uh, further details, mechanism of action and all that, I don't remember presently, but that's what I know. Probably if the gastroenterologist pitches in, they can put in a thought about that. And what exactly is Ribagen, ma'am? I'm just trying to go Google it. Yeah, even I'll have to do that and tell you. But, uh, but I just remember the dosage and uh, the duration that we give it. And it's for recurrent ulcers. I see. And in, yeah. and in your practice, this has been pretty standard medicine to give, right? Yeah, I have uh, given for uh, at least yeah half a dozen patients. I have given yeah. And what is what is your uh, review of this? Do you think these medicines they work better than placebo? They you have been getting good good feedback. Yeah, I have got like uh, uh, ulcer. See ulcers which are healing within two three days. Uh, fine, like the sir mentioned, ZIT gel and. Uh, um, uh, dentogel and those things, those are the usual things that are used. But then if there are more persistent at the same place and all, then we move on to Canacot or tri Triamcilolone, so those kind of steroid-based gels so that they help in the healing. So that is the only thing I would uh, add on to patients with recurrent ulcers. And if it is at the same place happening again and again, uh, in addition to the regular multivitamins and all those things. Yeah. Only if they have a lot of uh, GI issues also, like, uh, like lower GI issues, uh, any gastritis, IBS-like pictures and all, then uh, as the patient was advised for a colonoscopy, probably that can be done. And if any uh, IBS, Crohn's, anything else is there, that can be found out. Right, so that is what I was thinking that if he was advised uh, colonoscopy, my thought was less about uh, colon cancer and polyps. My thought was more about inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. Exactly. As they yeah. can have oral ulcer presentation. I still mm -hmm. would be very surprised if uh, IBD is presenting as an isolated oral ulcers without any GI upset. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm talking about major GI upset, not a non specific. Uh, gastritis, uh, although truly speaking at his age, it may not hurt to just do a screening colonoscopy and see what it is. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Thank I, you, there is one more question which actually came up uh, in, uh, in the WhatsApp group. And this is an unknown number for me. This is, I believe Dr. Jagannath. Uh, sir, if you are if you are live, then you can probably share your thoughts with us. I'm just reading your question. May go to biopsy, and that biopsy part, I would have Dr. Sopna Priya elaborate once uh, we give her a chance to share her thought. Uh, so I will reserve that question. You also mentioned hemogram and vitamin levels. I think that this is something I was expecting somebody to come up and say so far. So one of the basic labs that I would order in patient who has got a recurrent oral ulcer is hemogram and vitamin levels. Uh, vitamin levels, because if they are deficient, I can certainly treat it. And hemogram, because abnormality in hemoglobin levels or other, other parameters like red blood cells or platelet could be a sign of vitamin deficiency. So they, kind of, they are kind of working together, uh, both hemo, hemoglobin profile or a complete blood picture as well as vitamin levels. Uh, local hygiene has been discussed, teeth ulcerations or teeth causing ulcerations have been discussed. Uh, you also mentioned about BPH markers. This I am not able to understand what you mean by that. And uh, colonoscopy, of course, that is something we are discussing. So biopsy part will come to Dr. Swapna, but before that, Dr. Vijay, you had something to add? Yeah, good evening, Dr. 
Anup, I would like to add uh, one more thing is patient is on uh, gliptins. Gliptins are uh, known drugs which, which can cause uh, this uh, oral ulcers. And in this patient, my strong impression is it is only recurrent after ulcerations. That is number one. Number two, this the gliptins, gliptin induced. Third thing is cyclic neutropenia. Neutropenia, uh, the cyclic recurrent uh, oral ulceration. This is my thoughts. Thank you so much, sir. So it almost seems like we are running out of medications that we can use to treat patients. Uh, Nicorandil alpha blockers, beta blockers, and uh, gliptin. So at some point, I believe uh, we'll run out of uh, all the medications that we have to treat patients. But point well taken, whenever they are on these medications, I think we need to start looking at. <laughs> The other, the other spectrum of oral ulcer, which of course uh, this particular patient may not have, but is equally important is oral ulcer being a marker of systemic illness. Many of the time they are combined with other dermatology pathology, which sometimes we as, as a practicing cardiologist or enacting general physicians may not uh, or may, may skip, may not totally pay attention to. And this is where I think a comprehensive evaluation often comes into play. So I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Sopnapriya to share her thoughts about uh, how she would approach and referral for oral ulcer if the patient has to come to her. The indications for biopsy, how to, uh, how to um, what I would say, correlate oral ulcer with systemic illness, particularly hunt for any other uh, uh, skin pathology or any occult signs that we may be missing, and uh, some salient points on how we can differentiate a benign, otherwise uh, uh, non pathologic oral ulcer from a pathologic one. So, so uh, Dr. Sopna, all, all for you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be the part of this Wednesday hurdle. I have been here, hearing for a long time, but I'm happy to be a part of it. And I think this is one of the most common topic where we see the referrals of the patients where many a times they get treated, treated, and they're so much vexed up and they sometimes come to us accidentally many a times. But still, it is a component of oral ulcers. Sometimes it's being treated by ENT specialist or sometimes by gastroenterologist or sometimes by a dentist and even by a dermatologist. But before we started, we'll start with the case what we have started discussion. So if the patient has called up you on phone, definitely. But whenever the patient says he is getting recurrent ulcers, what is the location? Is it he, you have mentioned that he is not happening in the same place, but the morphology of the ulcer definitely determines how bad it is and how deep it is. And is it having any erythematous halo? What is the type of the base of the ulcer he is having? These all matters to diagnose us. First, is it an aphthous ulcer or just any other type of ulcers? So these oh, examination is definitely very important. Probably that's the reason <clears throat> you might not be helping much on phone. But one thing, if it is any systemic associated, like how we the gastroenterologist has suggested in a colonoscopy, usually the ulcers of that type usually happen in a buccal sulcus, not randomly in all the part of the mucosa, though they can still happen. And they also definitely should have symptoms of weight loss and all those things. Then instead of thinking in terms of colonoscopy and Crohn's ulcerative, I definitely would suggest to think about Bechet's in the patient who is having such a bad recurrent oral ulcers. Because oral ulcers as an after ulcers presentation happens in 90 to 100% of the cases in Bechet's disease. So that is one of the diagnoses where we may tend to miss many a times. So that is one differential we should also keep in mind. But after ulcers before diagnosis, definitely many a times we can diagnose. As already mentioned, complete blood picture examination is the most, most common thing. Many a times we treat, with, treat them with riboflavin. Not actually riboflavin, definitely iron, B12. Those are the more common deficiencies which we incur in case of after ulcers. And definitely after ulcers have three different types of presentations actually. Like routinely what we see clinically is smaller ulcers. But sometimes they can happen like bigger ulcers of even more than one centimeter. So when they happen in such a big size, Definitely, we should have a wider spectrum of differential diagnosis 
many a times when they happen such a bigger thing and this recurrent oral ulcers do not only happen in apthes but definitely femphigus vulgaris is one of the most most common though it is not very rare thing it is definitely most common for us in a practice i have seen many cases only presenting with exclusively oral femphigus and whom they have been treated for a very long time as a dental problem recurrently oral steroids for short period they come back again nutrition is badly affected these all happens like a vicious circle so that is another differential diagnosis where we have to think definitely when we are treating this sort of cases and when you are thinking about drugs definitely drugs can be the reason for a oral ulcers but usually 3 to 6 months is enough good enough time to rule out the causes of any drug induced oral ulcers so it is more than 3 to 6 months we don't need to think in terms of drug induced oral ulcers so definitely that can be ruled out because this is a case of 62 years male and who is taking medication since long time i think because these are all gliptins and other cardio drugs which he is taking is since very long time so if it is more than 6 months any drug associated ulcerations or any drug induced rashes happen within 3 months maximum or at a very bad scenario it can be up to 6 months so drug causes can be ruled out if it is more than that time so this is the way we usually approach the case definitely coming to the fungal infection aspect if you are thinking if it is a diabetic patient usually definitely the fungus part when we wipe off with the gauze it definitely goes off and it has a definitely curdy appearance whereas in an aphthous ulcer you have very clearly oval shaped ulcer which has a erythematous halo which is very painful very painful even patient when they try to eat food or when they are trying to speak also that definitely hinders their everyday activities like that painful will be the aphthous ulcers but whereas candidal ulcers will not be so painful and they have very ragged appearance the curdy precipitate on the surface irregular ulcers is what happens in case of candidiasis so this is one way easily we can differentiate candidal ulcers and aphthous ulcers and coming to the role of the biopsy biopsy role definitely aphthous ulcers is a clinical diagnosis and a diagnosis of exclusion role of biopsy only comes when we have to rule out other systemic causes like femphigus and other causes lichen planus lichen planus though very common presentation will be very superficial lazy appearance and not much very severe erosions only will be seen not ulcers but there are different morphological types even in lichen planus but ulcerative form of lichen planus is a rare form but still the patient will have typically only on the buccal mucosa more towards the molar areas on both the sides so that is the way they usually present for that sort of the cases definitely biopsy has a role and when the ulcer is happening recurrently in the same place healing partially again becoming very bad in no time so definitely that is a marker and an indication that you have to do a biopsy because if it is any other impinging cause of a tooth which is leading to some secondary chronic ulceration leading to any other type of malignancy so these are the three indications when i want to rule out from figures like in planus or a carcinoma then only i think about a biopsy otherwise routine biopsy i do not recommend in case of oral mucosal ulcers and coming to the management aspect definitely like all you are doing is definitely right in the early phase definitely using an anesthesia gel before they have their food definitely helps them to relieve lot of pain and have their normal nutrition more than 2 to 3 days which is not improving topical steroid cream for a very short period what happens is we give the prescription of a steroid and patient starts using by themselves so it is very important educate the patient when it is not responding and not improving for more than 2 to 3 days and it is really troubling don't use for more than a week on that particular area they tend to apply in a wider areas leading to again secondary complications so that education of the patient on that particular place is very important and even i have learned from my professors that doxycycline capsules where they take the granules of the doxycycline capsules put it in the honey mix it and they apply on the ulcers that is one way i have seen patients are also improving the reason behind it is not explained but definitely that has a role in treating in few cases which i have seen clinically very severe not responding nutrition causes always correcting anemia b12 definitely worth it to do it when there is an underlying cause and instead still patient has any other things like arthritis ocular complications and neurological evaluate from hla aspect to check out for bechets because the diagnosis is going up slowly these days about the bechets because of the diagnosis availability facilities and one more in the history which will very be helpful is 
associated genital ulcers when a patient is having oral ulcers along with the genital ulcers arthritis definitely and ocular problems it is our first thought we should think about bechet's disease and coming to the next uh, management aspect we go to the next level of management oral steroids this is a very rare scenario when patient has only major after ulcers which is not responding to the topical agents that to very short course period of time not more than even a week and patient has very dependency on the steroid that he he is needing to use every weekly once or monthly twice or thrice then probably using drugs like colchicine thalidomide is very rare scenarios but response to the drugs is very good and but we only opt them thalidomide is a very very stubborn ulcers where they are not responding colchicin probably the option to choose next to steroids when they are not responding is what we do clinically and thalidomide only a last resort but definitely explain to the patient about the side effects of the drug and other uh, side like neuropathy teratogenic then only we opt for thalidomide but otherwise very rare scenarios and other one thing which i want to tell is herpes also we have to ask the history in the patient if he gets any fever blisters on the upper lip that is one thing which we have to ask sometimes they can even develop recurrent oral ulcers also in that case so that is another scenario where you have to rule out this infective cause of recurrent ulcers then the treatment aspect changes because you have to use antivirals not steroids so differentiating from that also is very important this is what i clinically do when i see the patient of oral ulcers ma'am thank you so much for that exhaustive uh, comment i actually have few questions i have noted down for you yeah so uh, i'm just randomly going to ask uh, herpes you mentioned hmm so fever blisters that i think uh, most of us are uh, tuned to so whenever somebody says uh, i have got a fever and during fever i get these kind of blisters particularly when they are on the lips outside it becomes quite obvious um but what do you like uh, i'm sure all the presentations are not typical mm. and how do you diagnose them other than history is there some sort of smear or something that you can do or not required when it is see when it is on the lip where there are intact blisters smear will help but when it is in the intraoral where there is no fluid or blister fluid at all available it is very difficult to do a smear probably only in that case antibodies test hsv antibody test will help us and these ulcers usually are very painful herpes blisters are very painful and they tend to spread very fast where the feeding is also so badly affected and after ulcers are very discreet ulcers only 2 to 3 or 4 not more than that whereas herpes ulcers are multiple ulcers where they increase in number rapidly just in a short period of time <clears throat> can you have herpes also not in the lips but only on the mucosa inside that is very rare scenario definitely yes possible but very rare a uh, drug induced oral ulcers ma'am you mentioned other than the stevens johnson uh, or uh, toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis which i believe all of us have seen at least once in our life they are deadly deadly uh, presentations where i believe oral ulcer becomes a small part of the systemic illness but bearing those things with the kind of drugs that we talked about nicorandil and what not uh do you see patients who have been well maintained on long term treatment and now develop drug reaction or most of the time they start when a new drug is started on these cases no no i didn't get the question like you mean to say the patient has taken the other drugs for more than 6 months now when your drug has started what type of lesions do you mean to say after ulcers ulcers or some different type of any other lesions you will mean to say basically what are you the question sorry i kind of uh, uh, confused you with the question my my intention of asking the question is uh drug induced oral ulcers and i'm not talking about systemic reactions i'm talking about these oral ulcers drug induced oral ulcers do they typically occur when a new drug is started or they can also occur with the same drug which has been continuing for 6 months but now the oral ulcer started appearing no drug associated ulcers don't happen so long even not even anywhere in the literature more than 6 months no drug has caused any ulcers except like uh, probably alendronate like sort of drugs where they have a reflux associated problems that type of things you can think but not all the other common drugs which we just take orally routinely 
And then uh, you mentioned, uh, we did discuss about biopsy. Uh, what is the morbidity associated with biopsying these oral ulcers? Is it a simple thing to do or, or it's kind of a bit complex? Morbidity is like, it's simple, but until unless if the ulcer is very back on the palate sort of a thing, probably then we'll have to take them to the anesthesia, like OT table and do. Whereas if it is in the buccal mucosa and the lip, it is easier to do than in a local anesthesia in the OP basis. Definitely it is not pain, not very badly morbid. Probably within two days they'll recover. Something like a tooth extraction when we do just for a day or a two, how the patient will have to take some precautions. That will be the morbidity. But otherwise it's an OP-based procedure where they can get it done and go. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, you did mention about colchicin. Uh, what is the duration of treatment that you put them on? Usually, we see the response for a month or a two. Based on that, we tap the dose. If patient is responding, we continue. We can even give it for three to six months also. So if I, if I heard all the attendees who shared their thought, including yours, if I heard it correct, maybe uh, the treatment strategy for uh, aphthous ulcer, not any other systemic uh, illness, but an aphthous ulcer would be something like a, a general pain medication like a Zyti gel, uh, maybe with this Ribagen that Dr. Archana mentioned, if does not improve, maybe give topical steroid for not more than a week, while we also uh, look for hemogram and uh, correct vitamin deficiencies. If these things don't work, then uh, we can try colchicine or doxycycline capsule dipped in honey that you mentioned. And if Not that the, dip, the granules of it should be granules, empty. Right. And then you just apply it locally, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Or you do colchicine, and if that also does not work, maybe thalidomide. So that is that would be a basic Thalidomide. algorithm yeah. of aphthous ulcers. Yeah. And uh, obviously, we need to look for other signs to make sure that we are dealing with aphthous ulcer only, that we are not dealing with uh, other diseases. The things that you mentioned, I'm just reading it out. Bessette's disease you mentioned, which I believe is a scoring algorithm. There is no diagnostic test for Bessette's disease, right? Yes. It's a, it's a scoring diagnosis, right? Yes. And uh, pemphigus vulgaris, I as a cardiologist or GP don't know how to diagnose pemphigus vulgaris. So I believe this is something we'll have to rely upon dermatologists to decide, right? Uh, my, my impression is that you can have a isolated uh, pemphigus vulgaris involving only the oral mucosa, I believe that's a possibility? Definitely is a possibility. Many a time they're only present with oral. They're very fine. But after probably six months, one year, they start developing the lesions on the body. Right. Then lichen planus, you mentioned they're more like erosions than anything. Herpes, I believe most of us can diagnose herpes if it, forms in a, if it comes in a classical form. If it comes in a non-classical form, it will be difficult for us to diagnose. And drug-induced, we discussed about few of the drugs, namely nicorandil being on the top, but then uh, beta blockers, vasodilator beta blockers to be very precise, and uh, gliptins for the diabetes, and uh, alpha blockers. And then you mentioned uh, uh, the drug for uh, osteopenia, what was that? Alendronate. Uh, Alendronate, the bi uh, bisphosphonates uh, hmm. would have a long-term uh, complication. Like because of the reflex, sometimes they can have that. Right. So I hope I kind of covered most of what has been discussed. There are two questions uh, that came. One is from Dr. Manoj. He writes, is there a correlation between hydration level and oral ulcers? Uh, Dr. Manoj, I don't know of anything. I don't know if dehydration causes oral ulcers. Now, dehydration can certainly cause cracks in the lips. Whether that would qualify for oral ulcer, I don't know. If anybody has got any thoughts, they can share. Dr. Sokna, what do you think? Hydration and oral ulcers? No, no. there is no relation between the levels of hydration and the oral ulcers. I can certainly imagine that dehydration uh, can cause uh, cracked lips. And that is primarily the reason why we use uh, uh, lip balms, uh, particularly during winters. Pranith writes, inhalation steroids have been used more frequently now. Could that be one of the reason? This Pranith, I, I, I'm glad you asked this question. Uh, and this is something maybe again, Dr. Sapna, if you could uh, highlight. 
uh, every time when we give uh, uh, meter dose inhalation steroids to the patients, we always tell them that after they have used, they should rinse their mouth so that mm -hmm. there is no steroid deposition in the oral cavity and that will unnecessarily predispose them to fungal infection. Uh, could, these, could these inhalation steroids be implicated to oral ulcers knowing that steroid is one of the treatment for oral ulcers? What is your thought? No, I don't think uh, the inhalation ulcers are the inhalation, sorry, inhalation steroids are the reason. Probably the it acts as a local immunity suppressor, which probably attracts more uh, pathogens leading to that secondary ulcerations. Right. But not yeah. as such using of the ulcers, sorry, steroids leading to the ulcers. There is one more thing that I think we haven't touched uh, in the discussion yet. And I hope you are able to uh, share that thought as well. How about bacterial infection causing oral ulcers? We once a while, we read about or we encounter patients who have got these uh, uh, bacterial ulcers in the oral mucosa. I don't know how common it is, but I'm sure all of us have seen at least one such case where there are these pyogenic uh, pockets inside the mouth. Is it common? Do you see it? If you, if you do, tell us your thought process about it. I, in my practice, probably I don't see much bacterial associated, probably in the dental practice where they have cavities or some other secondary infections or some granulomatous lesions that get secondarily infected, probably yes. In that case, bacterial associated ulcers is a possibility, but as such, frank ulcer only secondary to bacterial infection, less. And in particular, like for say example, patient had a herpes, he gets neglected, leaving it for a long time. Secondarily, it gets infected, then leading to again an impetigo also ulcers. That sort of a thing can I have seen, but not as such a frank ulcer directly because of the bacterial infection. Thank you, Dr. Sopna. I'm going to continue my discussion with uh, other attendees. Dr. Archana, you, you need to add something or have a question. Please unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a point upon the... Uh, that's what after using the steroid inhalers, we tell them to rinse the mouth, no? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, the mainly it is because of the uh, bigger uh, uh, particles which can de get deposited in the mouth whenever they take the oral steroids. That is the uh, that starts coating on their mouth as uh, uh, white patches uh, at uh, uh, places if their oral hygiene is also bad. So that can later on result in uh, candidiasis, things like that. So that is why they are always told to rinse the mouth. It is because of the bigger particles. And that is reduced by the use of uh, when you use it with the spacer. Right. I think that point is absolutely well taken. Yeah. We did touch upon, we did touch upon uh, uh, the delivery system for uh, inhalation drugs like... Uh, uh, steroids and uh, Lama or Saba or those kind of drugs. We did discuss it in an hour discussion in one of our previous huddles. And there we covered a lot of the nitty gritties of how to go about uh, uh, advising our patients or how to instruct our patients for these. Uh, if anybody has got any thoughts or comments, please uh, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand or type it in the chat box and I'll read it out. And uh, while you do so, I'll uh, ask Dr. Somaraju for his opinion about today's topic. Somaraju, sir. Thank you, Anup. Uh, very important and interesting topic. What is the age of the patient? Uh, sir, age is 62. Yeah. It's very unusual for patients above 40s or 50s or 60s to start having after ulcers first time in life. When it happens, it's usually secondary to something else. And most often, in the age group you are talking about, if we have mm -hmm. fees on necrondyl, that should be the first possibility of stopping. Necrondyl has no time sense. It can happen uh, after a few days, it can happen after many months, or even later. So necrondyl should be the first uh, category you should stop and watch. The other drug is metformin, you should always keep in mind. <clears throat> variety of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms can occur. Mind you, necrondyl uh, gastrointestinal lesions uh, right from the mouth to the anus. Uh, anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, the lesions can occur. 
I know of patients where for a rectal ulcer, uh, <coughs> perianal ulcer, uh, anal ulcer, a surgery was advised. We, uh, we stopped in the crondyl and everything disappeared. And uh, anywhere in the gastrointestinal tract, tract, the ulcers can occur. There are instances where unnecessary surgeries were done. So the incidence can be as much as 1 to 5%. It is well reported in the literature. Gastrointestinal problems related to necrondyl. Today, necrondyl is used more often than even nitrates for uh, angina uh, for reasons best known to cardiologists. Thank you. Sir, before I let you go, uh, one question that I want to ask you, and I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. Uh, we, I, I mentioned this to Praneet about diabetes, and I'm asking this to you regarding vitamin deficiencies. We all have been taught from day one of MBBS that vitamin deficiencies are the cause of oral ulcers in majority of patients. Is it, is it an urban legend? Is it something that, again, we have been taught by our colleagues and seniors? Is there, is there a substantial science behind it? And do you see good response in patients whom you correct their vitamin deficiencies? I have seen innumerable examples where patients have oral ulcers, they pop in one B complex, and the next day they claim their oral ulcer has disappeared. I cannot imagine of a situation where B12 capsule results in resolution of oral ulcer within a day. Uh, I, I used to believe that those kind of responses are mostly placebo. I'm pretty sure there are actual deficiencies and there are actual improvement. But how much of that is there, I don't know. Sir, what is your uh, impression on it? You have been in this business for more number of years than what we have as our life. What is your uh, thought on this? Uh, vitamins should be supplemented. But uh, <clears throat> B12 is not generally the cause. Riboflavin and other vitamins are responsible. And uh, they should be supplemented. But uh, the cause and effect relationship, I agree with you, is a placebo sometimes. But it may be real uh, vitamin deficiency in some instances. So considering all these things, in a diabetic patient, the most important vitamin, uh, particularly the patient is on metformin is take care of B12 levels um, on and off, particularly when the patient has coronary artery disease or uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome or instant uh, uh, inside. Uh, take care of B12 because that can be thrombogenic also. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Praneet, I believe you had some work done on nicorandil and uh, oral ulcers. Can you just throw some light about what you have done uh, in your career and what is your overall impression? And you can probably also answer the question or the, or, uh, the bad name that Dr. Somaraju is putting on to us as cardiologists that we are giving more nicorandil than <laughs> the nitrates. Uh, Nicorandil, as you all know, is not a US FDA approved drug. And there are uh, limited uh, areas globally where this drug is approved. So tell us about this drug a little bit, Pranit. Yeah, so uh, one patient, uh, uh, we did a case report on a Nicorandil induced oral ulcer a patient with uh, acute coronary syndrome who used Nicorandil uh, and developed an ulcer, uh, went to a dentist did a biopsy with a suspicion of malignancy proved to a non-specific inflammation. And um, the dentist also suspected it could be nicorandal induced, but because he had to, this is a cardiac medicine, he asked a cardiologist approval before he stopped. So he came back. Uh, we agreed with the dentist, stopped the nicorandal and uh, the oral uh, ulcers uh, disappeared completely. So that uh, case was uh, reported and it got published. Regarding the usage of uh, Nicorandil, I agree with uh, Samraju sir about uh, usage of Nicorandil. Uh, I believe we get carried away by uh, using uh, uh, fancy terms like uh, using nitrate seed now old fashioned. So let's try a new fashion of uh, Nicorandil. But uh, a usage of Nicorandil has uh, no added advantage, I believe, in comparison to nitrate. Probably one temptation to use uh, Nicorandil is um, not having significant uh, hypertensive effects, which we often see with uh, nitrates. There are patients whose 
pressure cell borderline uh, you tend to give uh, nicorandel uh, because you don't want to have hypotension and that kind of leads to it uh, but even in the european uh, guidelines of um, angina there is no added advantage of uh, nicorandel in comparison to nitrate and it is contraindicated or a class 3 recommendation to add uh, nicorandel to nitrates so point well taken uh, that uh, nitrates are still the drugs of choice for angina management and only in patients where nitrates are not tolerated or is there any other indication probably nicorandel should be used uh, those are my comments i know dr uh, <coughs> pranit and uh, anup i just want to add particularly be careful when using nicorandel in patient who have elevated creatinine because it can produce a serious severe hyperkalemia unexpected be aware of it right i think sir we did bash nicorandil a little bit and i do want to get on this bandwagon why why i shouldn't pile on so since we are bashing nicorandil i don't think we will have a one hour session on nicorandil so we'll just take maybe another 2 minutes to bash the drug uh, pranith i have a question for you and maybe for all the cardiologists who are here on this forum now you can understand as an outsider when i came to uh, india outsider i mean uh, from the clinical practice standpoint i am as uh, i i belong to india as much as anybody else but since i came for uh, uh, professional practice uh, i started using nicorandil only after i came back here i never used nicorandil i never heard of this drug when i was in my training in us and i have overall adopted the practices which have been followed locally so here is my question to you pranith i never got this answer maybe you know it or maybe somebody else in the forum knows it when we give nicorandil iv infusion to our patients particularly after mi or pci or what not the typical dose we are giving is 2 mg per hour that means we are giving them a daily dose of 24 mg per hour uh, sorry 48 mg per hour but when we give them an oral nicorandil tablet we are giving them 5 mg twice daily or we are giving 10 mg per day oral dose which sometimes we exceed to up to 20 but i have not seen anybody prescribe more than 20 mg of nicorandil daily versus giving iv 48 mg in 24 hours is a routine practice can you can you tell me why this is there is iv dosing a little different than oral dosing is there difference in elemental nicorandil in this uh, maybe you can share your thought and anybody else in the attendee who knows to to take care of this dilemma pranit uh, the most important uh, usage of nicorandil in at least in interventional cardiology space is to abate the slow flow nori flow phenomenon that you encountered while intervening and uh, to abate that slow flow nori flow we start uh, sometimes intra coronary nicorandil and that continues as intravenous nicorandil uh, but as you said the duration of uh, iv nicorandil should be limited just for uh, getting out of that crisis where this nicorandil can help in getting away with that slow flow nori flow phenomenon and the usage of uh, intra coronary nicorandil at a high dosage should be limited it and, and i believe it should not exceed more than uh, 24 hours because most of the time that slow flow nori flow phenomenon will settle in that in that time uh, these are my thoughts but any other scientific rationale i am not aware either as well okay before we close the session anybody else has got any other comments or question about today's topic and if not pranith your closing comments on what we learned today i did kind of summarize a little bit but uh, you could close it yeah a fairly uh, common um, encounter which as a cardiologist you brush it off uh, because it doesn't uh, warrant any uh, a significant uh, intervention but a uh, uh, very valid uh, discussion that we had that uh, there are many drugs that you use in the cardiology space um which can be a reason for uh, reason for these oral ulcers and probably we need to look into the prescription that we are give, uh, giving and uh, may need a modification and that itself can solve getting a cross consultation with uh, other colleagues particularly dermatology and i wish we had gastro but i and the dentist uh, uh, is always pertinent and when in doubt it's worth taking a second opinion because they can look the same problem in a different angle and can give their 
thought process and the algorithm of treatment from local gels to steroids to tablets uh, was uh, excellent and you already summarized so and uh, when they are recurrent and when we don't have a clue then uh, doing a confirmation with the help of biopsy taking the help of again dermatologically colleagues to make a tissue diagnosis knowing the diagnosis and uh, keeping in mind about the systemic diseases like uh, bacteria and other inflammatory conditions is always important so a very valid discussion uh, that we had and uh, it was definitely enlightening for me uh, giving me more uh, light on oral health and this should not be neglected uh, particularly the drugs that we use uh, that was uh, something which was awesome that i learned today Thank you, Pranith. Thank you, Dr. Sokna, and thank you, everybody else who attended today's session and spared their one hour with us. Uh, as uh, I told at the beginning, this weekly huddle is telecasted every week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And uh, next week we'll be back with another topic, which I will share it on our WhatsApp group. If you haven't joined the WhatsApp group, uh, there is a link there in the invitation, so you should be able to join that. And uh, I will see you all uh, next week. Dr. Sopna, you have something to add? No, 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 nothing. Else. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for joining. And thank you, all of us, uh, all of you. We will see you next, uh, next Wednesday. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys.